Good evening. I'm Kristen Gilger, the Associate Dean at the Cronkite School. I'm glad to see so many people here tonight. I like it when we have to set up extra chairs for our speaker. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. Jennifer Sizemore is Vice President and General Manager and Editor-in-Chief of NBC News Digital. She oversees the global editorial staffs and drives the business strategy for NBCNews.com and Today.com. She also holds the title of Executive Producer for NBC News. That's a lot of titles. That's really a, a lot of titles. Um, all told, the websites under her direction draw an audience of 50 million monthly users, unique users. Uh, Jennifer joined MSNBC.com in Seattle in 2005 as Deputy Editor for News. Prior to that, she was Deputy Managing Editor for News at the Houston Chronicle. She comes out of the newspaper business. And she was Assistant Managing Editor at both the Seattle PI and the Rochester New York Democrat and Chronicle. She graduated from the University of Washington in Seattle with a degree in political science, but she also holds an MS in journalism from Northwestern University, we won't hold that against her, and an MBA from the University of Washington. Jennifer serves on the accrediting committee for U.S. Journal University Journalism Schools. She also serves on the Knight Digital Media Advisory Board and the Investigate West Board of Directors. She's been a judge for the Hearst Foundation College Journalism Championships, which is near to, and dear to our hearts, and a judge for Best of Gannett. And she often speaks around the country on digital media, media and the fast-changing news media landscape. Jennifer is a leader in the media industry at an interesting time. Just recently, Microsoft and NBC officially separated their online business relationship, which dates back more than a decade. MSNBC became NBC News with a new logo, but still delivering original multimedia content to millions on the web each day. Jennifer's topic tonight is Digital journalism. If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. I love the title. Please welcome Jennifer Sizemore. Thank you, Kristen. Oh, that's loud. So I made my doctor promise me that I would be off the crutches by today, and he failed to mention that I would still be wearing my really sexy boot. So I apologize in advance for hobbling around the stage while we talk. Um, it also sort of put a crimp in my travel as I had to take the boot through airport security yesterday and the boot needed to be tested for bomb juice, of course, and the boot failed the test for bomb juice. So while I was getting the full body pat down and being asked questions like, did you fertilize your lawn recently? They unpacked everything in my bags. So the good news there is that the TSA Guaranteed tease that the swag I brought you is not explosive. So um, we're gonna do, I didn't bring enough for everybody. It's like I should have learned that in elementary school, but I need someone with a good arm who can hurl swag. One volunteer. And we'll just start with a few questions and the first person with an answer gets some swag hurled at them. I hope you have good catching hands out. So this is actually kind of a funny little package of swag. It's some of its, um, I sound like I have some hard S's in there. Um, some of it is collector's items because it's our old logo and I didn't just clean out the closet. It's cool stuff. There's a good hat in here. Um, and at least one thing has our new NBC News digital logo in here. So I'll explain all that in a minute. But here's one to uh, toss. Okay, who's already tweeted from this, this uh, whoop, right there. Swag for that guy. Nice. <laughs> What's your name? Sarah. Sarah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, all right, let's see. Let's do this. Keep your hand up until it no longer applies to you. I have with me at least one digital device with a screen. <laughs> I have, yeah, you may, you're going to get one anyway. Um, I have at least two digital devices with a screen on my body and be prepared to show. I have at least three digital devices with a screen on me. I have at least four digital devices with a screen on me. Do we have a four? Do you have four? No. Who has three? Okay, one of you come up here and show us your three. 
I'm surprised. Usually I get five. Two phones. An iPod and a phone. An iPod, a phone, and a laptop. You can toss her her swag. Very nice. Okay, we're trying one more here. <laughs> a calculator. I hadn't even thought of that. It's journalism school. You have a calculator? <laughs> yeah, you never know. Does it do journalist math or real math? And a phone. She can have some swag, too. It counts. All right, we're, let's move on to the next one. Um, who do you think, who, if you think you're here from farthest away, raise your hand. <laughs> I met some people earlier today who probably uh, all qualify. G give me a shout out from where you're from. <laughs> South Africa. <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> I want to do one more of those because I think she's sitting next to someone from Ethiopia and that might be even farther away. <laughs> yeah, all right. Woo! It's not breakable, just a water cup. Um, let's see. One more thing. Who's taking economics this quarter? Semester. Really? Do you love it? You will, you will learn to love it. We'll talk a little bit about economics today and why it matters, and I promise we won't bore you. <laughs> and, um, I broke my laptop three times, it's not funny. Yeah, no, that's not funny. Breaking your laptop is a very sad state of affairs. All right, so, I just want someone to give me their pitch. Stand up and tell me why you deserve some swag. <laughs> Wait, 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 I didn't hear that. Wow, were you in high school back in April? Yeah. Oh, you're gonna recognize some of my material, so you really get some swag. <laughs> okay, one more. As a single mom who's decided to come back to school and make a difference in the world. That deserves some swag right there. And I have yours for later. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Clicker. So we're going to actually do what we're here to do now. Um, as Kristen mentioned, I'm Jennifer Sizemore. I work at what is now known as NBCNews.com, NBC News Digital. It's a little confusing. It's only about two months old for all of us, so I'll get into that a little. Um, but what we're really here to talk about is the state of the digital journalism industry and how there's a ton of opportunity in it. But if you're not living on the edge and taking chances and being willing to fail, you probably are missing those opportunities, which is why when I heard this quote, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room, it seemed like just the right thing to title our talk about, talk with. So I'm just gonna set the table for what we're gonna talk about here today. Um, first, we'll talk about the industry a little bit, what's going on in the industry. And then we'll look at demographics and how, as the world is developing, presents an amazing opportunity. We'll scoot over a little to economics, overlaying the demographics, and talk about how all of that is driving this explosion of technology that is simply another way for us to distribute our content. And then we'll talk about content and what all of this means to that. Are we really redefining content? Are we doing something else entirely? We'll talk about that a little. So Tom Peters famously said, if you're not paying attention, Oh, if you're not confused, you're not paying attention. And if you talk about an online news consumer, there's nothing closer to the truth. Online news consumers are just totally nuts. In fact, news consumers in general are anymore. They're voracious, they're fragmented, they're always updating and insisting that you always be updating as well. And damn if they're not disloyal. They love you one day and they hate you the next. So really what we're facing is an industry and a, a marketplace that is in chaos, but 
you know, in chaos, we like to say there's opportunity. Miriam Webster likes to say that chaos is really an unorganized state before creation of distinct forms, a state of utter confusion, or a confused mass or mixture. And I think all of those things apply to where we stand right now in the online news industry. But that chaos, like I said, truly gives us opportunity. If you look, if you stand on the edge and look a little bit harder than you might be, instead of seeing, oh my God, there's no jobs up there and there's no way for this to ever be a good business, give me just a minute and we'll talk through that. So I'm gonna back up here for a minute and explain my employer. So this guy, 16 and a half years ago, you guys know who this is, I assume? I hope so. Um, got together with this guy, and they said, you know, just in case this internet thing is a real thing, maybe we should put together the technology expertise and the news gathering expertise of NBC News and create one of those website thingies. And while we're at it, let's put all of our consonant initials into one brand name and uh, make sure that no one can ever pronounce it or remember it. Um, but they did that, and littlemsnbc.com grew, had lovely parents who nurtured him and, and really helped him out and invested in millions, and I mean millions of dollars, in that venture. And then hard times hit. The dot-com bust, millions of dollars in losses, layoffs, it was an ugly time. And like happens in most families with financial troubles, who gets caught in the middle? Little MSNBC. The parents were at war, and they finally figured out what to do. NBC News would buy back the 24-hour cable channel by the same name as the website, and wholly own that. And the two parents would agree to continue to co-parent this news website. So little MSNBC, all grown up with a bit of a trust fund, went out into the world and frankly was pretty darn successful. It's been one of the top three news websites in the country for most of its history. So it's a little confusing, so let's review. MSNBC.com has not been MSNBC cable. Owned differently, managed separately. I have been on hardball, and it was the worst day of my life. We have also not been Microsoft, though MSNBC.com was by contract the exclusive news provider to MSN.com and any other Microsoft property that felt like it needed to have news. You guys know who that is, right? I assume Steve Ballmer, CEO, Microsoft. And you probably know who this guy is too. Um, we, we have not been solely NBC News. Yes, we've been the home, and again, contractually, the digital home for all NBC News reporting, um, but we also have 120 journalists of our own around the world doing original work just for the website. So all was going along well, and then, I mean, Comcast bought NBC, and this guy, not as familiar probably, Brian Roberts, the CEO of Comcast, went back to this guy, this guy again, and said, it seems like NBC News ought to wholly own its digital future. This makes perfect sense. If I'm NBC News, I want to wholly own my digital future and not have to fight with Microsoft about what that looks like. Because when two parents own 50%, nobody gets to decide, which is why it's been really fun, because then the kid gets to decide. So we've had a great time. But they made a deal. And that's why we're now called NBCNews.com. That was announced exactly two months ago, July 17th. So you can ask questions about that later, but that's sort of the, the summary of how we came to be here. Oh. That's just a gratuitous stop on the Tom Brokaw slide because I know we're at the Cronkite School, but he's an extremely attractive older man. <laughs> All right, back to business. Um, so this is what we always have known journalism to be. Are they still teaching the five W's in journalism school? Who, what, where, why, and when? Well, I'm here to propose that there's now a six W. <laughs> and last time I said it out loud, I got in trouble in front of an audience, but you can translate. Um, 
We really don't know what's going on. In fact, the things that we have held to be absolutely true about the crazy state of our industry, like that newspapers were definitely dying, doesn't that doesn't even turn out to be true. There are plenty of small local dailies and community weeklies that are thriving and even hiring. So what does all this mean and how do we figure it out and how do we navigate it? Well, really, I think ultimately the only way to find that edge is to walk away from everything you think you used to know. And that's a little discombobulating until you realize that what we're looking at is truly a world of opportunity, a world where when we look at down into the demographics, demand for information is virtually limitless. So let's talk a little bit about your generation. There are 10 million millennials poised to move out of the house. Many of you may have not done that yet, but when you do, you'll be poised to begin spending in a way that we haven't seen in this country in decades. And what happens when people begin spending? They need information. And what happens when they begin spending after they find information? Well, they spend money on information. That's where you come in. And you know this generation we've heard about our whole lives, the baby boomers, the generation that ate America? Well, it turns out there were more of you than them. There were more millennials than baby boomers. And you know what? You're more important because you're willing to pay full price. This chart just shows you how household spending goes up as we get a little older, and this shows you how it goes down as we require our 65 and over discount, which I'm sure never happens here in Arizona. So your audience, and you're lucky in this way, your audience is also your generation. So you already have a unique foothold in understanding them. But what else do we know? Your audience will be different than any audience that we've seen before. It'll be more diverse, it'll be wired, it'll be mobile, it'll be almost exclusively online consumers. And for the very first time, we will see more women who are heads of household and more women who are better educated than the men. Um, that was not intended to elicit that, but okay. Um, this chart just shows you the diversity of spending on information across generations and across ethnicities. And this chart is to remind me to say, guys, go to class, because the women are already outpacing you as a percentage of the college graduates. So one thing you're gonna need to learn to do is think about your audience and your generation also as your customers. And there's even more to know about them. They're about 35% college educated. Household income is ri rising at $21,000 a year. Over the next three years, millennials and Gen Xers will have six million marriages and 13 million children and millennials' children are already consuming content online. Have you seen a three-year-old with an iPad? And globally, the story is, I think, even more interesting and more full of opportunity. As the developing world sees its growth slow, and people have time to take a breath and think about more than just surviving, they have rising aspirations. And what do they need? They need information. They need content. And as Peter Francesi, who is a wonderful demographer who gave me much of this data, says, I can't read it from here. My eyes aren't that good. The demand for online content globally is virtually limitless. In some cases, it's just an economic op opportunity. But for many nations, obtaining and distributing content will be critical to their political stability. There's growth here, there's opportunity here to make a difference, to do content that matters. In India, in the last five years, the news business has doubled in value. So let's take a minute and overlay some economics on the demographics. Sorry, we won't do Econ 101, though this is a, it's not much more complex than that. It goes a little more like, so since the economy is right now in what do we call officially the shitter, 
Um, people's spending is flopping for the first time and people are spending actually less on cars and homes and more on education and technology. And what do we know from basic economics? When there's an increase in demand, there's an increase in supply. And so what we're seeing is a proliferation of technology, of devices, of platforms, and a fragmentation that, to such a degree that we literally can't quantify the different combinations of operating systems, devices, platforms, I could go on. But what we do know is that people are buying this stuff and they're using this stuff. A June study from the Online Publishers Association tells us there are 107 million smartphone users in the U.S. now and 74 million tablet users in the U.S. And that number is surprising in a lot of ways. And already, about 10% of all digital page views are happening outside of what we call the classic web. The classic web is your desktop or your laptop. So already 10%, and this number's probably changed because they're quoting a year ago. Already, 10% of those are happening on some kind of device that isn't your traditional computer. This just shows the booming usage and ownership of smartphones in less than a year, up 11 percentage points, and expected to go up another 11 percentage points by early next year. This is just the breakdown of what people are buying. It's about half Android, or ha about as many Android as iPhone. Poor sad little Blackberry bringing up the rear and dying slowly. And then the rest not so smart, but as we see that not so smart piece of the pie is getting smaller and smaller. But here's the story that I think truly tells us about a new opportunity for us as people who create content and distribute information as our calling, as our living. Tablet adoption is exploding. In fact, the adoption of tablets is faster than of any device released in recent history. And it's expected to be at about 50% of US adults by early next year. And they've really just become a part of people's lives. I was really surprised to not see anyone showing me a tablet as one of their multitudes of devices. They're still expensive. Not all of them, we'll talk a little bit about that too. But it, people who own them are using them like crazy. They're not just using them daily, they're using them multiple times a day. And they're spending tons and tons of time with them. But I think what's most interesting about this chart is the one here on your right. And it shows a time shift in when people are using their tablet to go online. So traditionally, in the online news business, we have a prime time, and it's the work day. Nine to five, you know, across time zones, it sort of shifts a little. But that's when we can count on the majority of our traffic. Tablets have added a couple, three more hours to prime time. If that's not opportunity, I don't know what is. And people are using them voraciously, multiple, multiple times a day. And again, what is it that they are accessing? Content information is the number one thing. People aren't just watching silly stuff or shopping. They're looking for content. And what are the top four content areas they're looking for? Video news segments, weather, local news, and national news. We do that. That's incredible. And then, of course, there are all the apps. There are already more than a half million in iTunes, and that's not to mention all of the ones that work on Android and in iOS, and the Windows Phone 7, soon to be Windows 8 apps, and, of course, the Xbox, and on and on. But this is to remind me to tell you, if I had not already, and I don't think I have, that you all need to learn how to code. In the future, you knowing how to code will be you owning the printing press or you owning your own broadcast network. Even if you think you're going to be a narrative storytelling specialist, God bless you, if you want control over when who and how people see the content you produce, learn how to code. And what is it that everybody is looking at on all these devices? Well, they're, they're 
immersing themselves in the experiences. And there's this mega mobile debate going on right now that I hope we solve soon. But there's this, a question of, should we be developing an HTML5 for universal web access across the mobile web? Or should we instead be taking advantage of the native capabilities of various devices? The latter is much more expensive. Uh, the former is still not up to snuff when it comes to total experiences. But there's something kind of beyond just sort of the look and feel and functionality that is actually almost an extension of an experience that I think is more of an ecosystem. And this is just a snip, obviously, of, a, of an actual uh, Kindle Fire promotion. Uh, but it's a decent enough illustration of what Amazon decided to do when it first released the Kindle Fire. They said, you know what? We're going to lose money on every single device we sell. Well, that makes no sense, right? Not in economics, that makes no sense. But here's what they did. They built an experience so addictive and so immersive and, oh, wait, so easy to buy from that the minute they hooked you, why go anywhere else? Once you have an Amazon Prime membership, I'm not sure you need to even leave the house. And <laughs> I have an iPad. I also have a Kindle Fire. I knew this was happening to me. I let it happen to me. I love it. Get one. Um, but it's, it's brilliant. It's, it's, uh, it's really much more about the entire ecosystem and the marketplace. So it's more complex than just how we're making things behave on certain devices. But in the end, the good news for us, I think, is that what is driving all of this consumption is an interest in information. People are actually more interested in content now than maybe ever. They're consuming more of it at more times in more ways than we've ever seen before. And when we're building things for our audience at what's now called NBCNews.com, we talk about it as an infinite loop of consumption, where people never, essentially never, stop consuming information. And instead of being, you know, assuming you were going to be the one-stop shop or you were the, the, the one authoritative place people would go, now we feel like we've succeeded if we've just earned one spot on your infinite loop. But it, it's crazy. When you look at how people are consuming information now, I was watching a talk given by a guy who's an internet expert a few weeks ago, and he literally, while talking, pulled his iPhone out of his pocket, checked it, put it back in his pocket, and kept talking. I, I guess that's the infinite loop, information in, information out, but it's a little crazy. So if all of this technology is changing web consumers, is it or should it be also changing our definition of content? And is it true that if there are more content providers, there's more content? Well, I'd argue no, right? I mean, if you wrote something and I summarized it and posted it, am I a content provider? Sure. Did I add more content to the universe? No, I didn't. So that leads us to kind of the crux of all this. What is all this exploding technology, all this really interesting stuff going on, these demographics, these economics, this necessity of us being willing to experiment and fail and try again with all kinds of different platforms and storytelling? What does all this mean to what we really describe as content? So I'm going to set the stage for this little case study, and you may have caught up with it a few months ago. But it starts with a very long New York Times Magazine article. Wait, that's, that's redundant. Um, <laughs> um, a very interesting article uh, about how companies figure out how to target consumers individually and make sure that they get individual messages about what they personally might buy. Well, a Forbes.com reporter read it, thought it was pretty interesting, picked it up, summarized it for her audience, wrote a pretty good headline on it. And that's just the way the web goes anymore, right? Well, Nick O'Neill, who's the founder of Social Times, 
noticed this phenomenon happening. And he wrote a post and a provocative headline, basically suggesting that Forbes had stolen the New York Times story and got all the traffic. It certainly got a whole lot more traffic than the New York Times story did. So Jim Romanesco, if you don't read Romanesco, you should. Lots of interesting journalism dilemmas discussed there. Jim Romanesco decided to get the principles in this story together and have them weigh in and talk about what this meant. So Cash Hill, who's the Forbes reporter who did this, says, you know what? I took a great piece by an excellent reporter, created a version that worked for my audience. This is a big part of what I do as a new journalist. Okay, let's look at the headlines. Here's the New York Times headline. Here's the Forbes headline. Let's look at them together. Which one would you click on? So Romanesco went back to Nick O'Neill, who said, hey, hey, wait, I wasn't saying that Kashmir did anything wrong or that it's a bad thing. I've done the same thing and I don't feel bad about it. Look, it's just kind of the game we're playing. And I thought, when I read this, really? Is that what we're doing? We're playing a game? We decided to go into this as a calling, as a profession, even as just a job, and we're playing a game? I don't know. So I was looking forward to reading what Charles Duhigg, the New York Times reporter who wrote the original story, had to say. And he says, kind of surprisingly, I think, hey, every journalist relies on other people's work. I became a reporter because I wanted to find out new things and inform the world about them. It doesn't really matter how that gets done. But then he said this. At the end of the day, I think it's worth gently posing the question. What do you want to do with your life? Every hour spent summarizing is an hour spent not reporting. And at the end of the day, this job is only really fun if you discover what no one else already knows. So in a way, I feel like he was summer or badly paraphrasing Margaret Thatcher's do something, don't just be something. But in a way, I think that might be what we're saying here today, that maybe how we live on the edge and take advantage of this amazing opportunity that's coming down the pike is that we do new journalism, put new information into the universe, and don't just be a content provider. Thank you. So I think we're going to take questions. Megan's running around with microphones. I'm right behind you. <laughs> We've got one back here. Where do you think uh, digital news is going to go in the future? Do you think it'll be mostly video or more towards print? And how do you see you know, NBC News handling that? Um, I think, first of all, I like to call it text. Print implies physical object. Um, I think it will continue to be a mix. Um, people definitely are consuming, continuing to consume digital video. I think that there's a lot of really bad digital video out there when it comes to news coverage. So I think we'd better get better at it if we want to continue to grow that segment of our business. Um, I think the tablet adoption speaks to that, the necessity of getting better at that and continuing to do digital video news in new and interesting ways. At the same time, what's clearly booming is the ability for people to consume multiple times a day in, in, in an efficient manner. And we can probably all agree that Text is a lot faster way to absorb some, something uh, than video. It's a different experience. So I honestly think it's still gonna stay a mix. And at NBC News, obviously, video is, is their core competency. And the good news is now they wholly own us and ours is, and digital is our core competency. So I think we'll be able to marry those pretty well. Hello. Hi. Um, in our JMC 194 class, we talked a lot about 
how newspapers, how you know, news broadcasts and online news sites are constantly trying to redefine themselves or define themselves. And so I would really love to know, you know what you define NBCnews.com to be as. We're at a somewhat awkward parentage point in our history, but I will tell you what we have built the website to be. We, and we believe it should be and will be going forward. We believe that our job at NBCnews.com, and this sounds lofty, it sounds a little corny maybe, we believe our job is to stoke the world's curiosity. And that is not just to satisfy the world's curiosity, but to tell people something they didn't know they knew in order to suggest to them that maybe they should know some more. Because in the end, we really do believe, and again, maybe it sounds corny, we really do believe a more informed world is a better world. And if we can stoke the world's curiosity, what better way to get there? Um, you were talking about writing code. Uh, where's the best place to learn how to write code? Uh, your basement. <laughs> I, I, teach yourself. You can teach yourself. Um, most of the people I work with who are really uh, excellent developers taught themselves um, in all kinds of different things. So I, I know there's at least one class here that teaches people to code. Um, but you also can teach yourself. If, they, if there's an HTML for dummies book, I know you can do it. So with all of the different platforms out there, HTML5 versus native versus do I make a responsive site, how does your organization try to tackle, like, where do I spend my dollars? <laughs> That's a really good question. That's why I said I really hope that mega mobile debate gets solved soon, because even within our organization, we have people in the HTML5 universal app camp, and we have people in the we must take full advantage of the native capabilities of the device camp. In the end, you have to choose based on expense at some level. And how do we re best reach our customers? What we've learned, and it's interesting, is that people who bother to download your app use it obsessively. So though we have about a quarter of the downloads of our main news app, it has 10 times as many page views as our mobile web. So that many fewer users consuming that much more audience or that much more content. However, the numbers for mobile web are great, so you, don't, you want to serve those people too, but at some level you have to think the experience probably should be different because people are using them differently. So it's a hard one. Trust me, we fight about it all the time in a good way. Hi. Hi. Um, as far as the copy itself goes, like you've edited for uh, print publication you've edited for online. Do you mm -hmm. think that the copy itself has changed? Do reporters that report mainly online write differently than those that report for a newspaper? That's a good question. Um, I think seven years ago I would have said, a good story is a good story, good journalism is good journalism. No, everything's the same. But what we're learning is that one of the gifts we have from the digital platform is that we can report iteratively. We don't need to wait for the whole story to tell you something has happened. We can tell you that it's happened and then continue to add context as it develops and, and deliver that in a seamless way that's easy to understand and easy to follow and dive in and out of as you're following the story. So I think it's that iterative approach to writing that has changed digital writing that we, we certainly had never had any reason to do for a, something that published once a, once a day. There's still a place for the longer fully formed story it's just that we have these opportunities to use the digital platform in more interesting ways. More questions? Hi, I'm Robert. I tweeted Hi, Robert. you, I think. I did tweet you. Um, so my question kind of is about um, how do you, uh, how does NBC News uh, plan to push the boundaries of technology? I know when, when a Twitter comes out, you get a Twitter page. When you get a Facebook, Facebook comes out, you get a Facebook page. So how does NBC plan to keep up with all these different sorts of medias and mediums coming out? And do you have any plans to create some of your own? Um, I, I, I think that 
It's a really good question. It's hard, right? There's so many new things all the time. And, and I, I think if I took a two month sabbatical, I'd come back and be clueless. Things would have changed so much. Um, I mean, really, anyone who tells you right now that they know what's gonna happen in two years is either, either lucky or lying. And, and so we, we make a lot of best guesses. And that means that sometimes we invest in something that we have to walk away from. And that's super painful. We've been a really frugal organization, so doing that really hurts. But it's better than continuing to invest in something that's just not where people went. Um, we have people whose job it is to kind of look to the future and think big and, and, and innovate and propose projects. Um, but in the end, at a, at a digital outfit, that's sort of everybody's job. Um, what, what kind of role do you see, uh, like citizen journalism and blogging, uh, what kind of role do you think that has on the future of online journalism and uh, uh, the company you work for? Okay, a couple of questions there. Um, first of all, I don't think there's really something that is, I, I, I don't think citizen journalism is really a thing. I, I think it's a buzzword that we decided to label regular people putting out information with. Um, so, and I also think that blogging, not to parse your words, but I think blogging is a platform, not a style. So we have blogs that are investigative reporting. That's not the same thing as some guy in his underwear in his mom's basement blogging out his opinion, right? But it's the same platform. So I think that there is more and more room for everybody's voice. I actually believe that online gives us, actually democratizes the news in a really interesting way. I think that our job is to continue to be a filter for that, um, to use the vast uh, citizenry as, as great sources, um, but there continues to be a need for trained people to verify and, and knit together stories that can't be told in other ways. Uh, how do you see social media affecting journalism in the future? Well, if I tried to answer that, then I'd be going against that. Anyone who tells you what's gonna happen is either lucky or lying. Um, so I, all I'll say is that, I mean, social media is what it is, is media. It's not really, I, I don't consider it to be a different, Facebook is just a platform, Twitter is just a reporting tool. It, you know, everybody's using everything. Um, and, you know, our report coming from a website owned by a legacy news organization had better be just as social as the next thing. And that's, I never an answered that part of the question. No, we don't plan to build our own social platforms. There are plenty of, plenty of them out there for us to experiment with. In many regards, journalism is still playing catch up to the new mass multimedia on mobile. And how do you pl actually plan on monetizing that? Because people still don't want to pay for it. Can you tell me what you mean by journalism is catching we, up? We're, many organizations still seem to be trying to figure out, as you mentioned earlier, the best way to reach mobile consumers. And as new technological innovations and new platforms appear, which they are rapidly, how is NBC News anticipating these and planning on monetizing them so journalists are still around? <laughs> um, well, that's so, it's sort of the same question, I think, where it, I think we're, for example, we all, it's everybody's job. We all own different phones, so we can tell how they're different. And, you know, everybody wants to have, be the fancy iPhone person, so I have an Android just to be different. Um, but, you know, really, we develop something, and it, and it can break... It can be an Android experience, but a different handset, and it won't work. It's, it's extremely complex and messy right now and very expensive. Um, but in the end, you have to figure out where your audience is, and that's really, it's pretty knowable. Uh, you can do some quantitative research and figure out where people really are and how they want to consume your information. And then you just have to build the right experience for them. And I think it is increasingly different. So people consume differently on their phone than they do on their tablet and than they do on their desktop. And I mean, when you think about kind of this sit back and watch a video news segment experience, that makes a lot of sense on your desktop while you're sitting there at work. It makes a whole lot less sense on your phone, I think. So again, we have to tailor the product for the platform 
and it, that's just an ongoing effort. Um, the Arizona Republic recently went to a subscription based for online media. That was you, today, right? Yeah, do you think that's a smart business decision? Um, you know, I am really glad that I don't have Randy Lovely's job, though I wish I had his name. Isn't that a great name? Um, I, I don't know. I haven't looked at their books. I don't know their. Uh, I don't know what they're facing. I, it's. I don't know. I, it's not the choice I probably would have made, but it might be absolutely the right one. Um, you were in our class earlier today, and we were talking about uh, how MSNBC, well, your guys' website, whatever it's called now. Whatever it's called. Uh, <laughs> you know, that thing you are in charge that of. The thing that pays my bills, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you talked about how you guys don't put any AP content on anymore, that you guys try to do all your own content. Could you kind of explain like why you do that and how uh, you guys uh, stuff you guys can't go cover? How do you cover it? Okay, so a couple of years ago, we realized we sort of took stock of the industry and realized that this is increasingly a world where you have to have content that's searchable, followable, shareable, or you have no distribution. In the in the end, distribution is your business. And we realized that what was none of those things was commodity content, the same content that everybody else had. And we could prove that to ourselves day after day by doing a Google search for the same AP story that everybody else had and finding our result on page 16. And that wasn't gonna drive our business going forward. So we actually turned a newsroom of people who produced about 20% original content, pretty much high-end projects, investigative stuff, um, immersive, on-the-scene stuff, and, but 80% wires, partners, and NBC News content. We turned that newsroom in a year to 80% original work, headlines no one else has, stories no one else is doing, and 20% of the rest. It's been painful. It's not all good. Um, you know, these are people who are all trained journalists, but who had been using different muscles for a lot of years. Because 16 years ago, just posting an AP story on the web was groundbreaking. And even eight years ago, taking an AP story, making it more multimedia, adding more elements to it, was still pretty groundbreaking, and it was a damn good business. But the world has changed. So that's why we did that. Jen, go back to the uh, demographic uh, comments you made. Wave, um, I can't see you. Oh, there, right hi. Um, what are the implications of uh, what you said, especially about uh, women being more uh, better educated than men uh, moving forward? What, uh, what implications do you see of that in, for your content generation and for <laughs> the way it's consumed and so on? Um, I hadn't actually thought about that. Uh, I didn't. I just thought it was an interesting shift. I didn't see it as a as like a world. I mean, it doesn't matter. To, I mean, it doesn't matter that there, more women have college degrees than men. What do we think? Does it? <laughs> um, she said women are still getting paid less. So yes. Um, I, 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 does it mean that we'll need different? kinds of content? I, I kind of don't think so. I mean, we already don't think about content in terms of gender, and when we paint a target audience for a product, we talk in psychographics instead of demographics. So it's someone who behaves this way and believes this way, as opposed to 18 to 34 year old female. Um, so for us, I don't think that changes much. It, I mean, maybe it does down the road, but in the end, I just think it's, the, it's, it's an interesting shift, um, and it says a lot about your generation. Wait, you already had one. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's, what's your vision for, for comments on the web? For oh, a long comments. time, there's, okay. been, there's been comments on I can, stories. I can, yeah, I'll take that. Um, so I think that 
seven years ago, having comments on your news story was sort of cost of entry. But there wasn't Facebook seven years ago. There wasn't Twitter seven years ago. I think it often the execution of user comments on news websites devalues the content. Um, that said, you have to think about it also, I hate this, but from a business point of view, we get boatloads of page views from those comments. People read them. And, and I think mostly they're lurkers who are reading them. They aren't the people who are commenting. They're just like, can you believe people said that? Oh my God, can you believe it? And is, is that valuable? Maybe it is. I mean, I, I kind of feel like they're harmless anymore. If you want to read them, you can. Uh, if you're going to be shocked by them, you probably aren't. I don't even notice them anymore, though I, you know, even though I still get letters telling me how we, you know, have allowed profanity on the website or whatever, and it's like, yeah, sorry. I just think they're sort of old-fashioned, is the short answer to your question. I think we should move on, find the next best thing, or just send them to Facebook. And we've done that quite a bit in a lot of places. Last call. Oh, it's not quite last call. One more? Uh, yep. <laughs> hey, as long as it's good. <laughs> um, I know immediacy is a big part of digital journalism. How fast do you get it reported when a story breaks, and uh, how does that work exactly? How fast do we report a story when it breaks? Uh, we break it the minute we know it and the minute we can confirm it. Um, we gather our information from every available source. So we have an in-house tool that all of the NBC producers file to as they learn stuff. So that's one way. Um, we have people obsessively watching Twitter and other kind of more citizen news outlets. Um, we have a brand called breakingnews.com that consistently will tell you something happened before anybody else does and they don't do it without verifying. So they're a great source for us and they're sit right in our newsroom. Um, so just a wide variety of things. A, a couple years ago when the Fort Hood shootings happened, um, we learned about it on cable TV. We wrote a story, we got on the phone, did a bunch of research, had a full story leading our website before the AP had moved an alert. So it can be done. All right. No Thank way. you, everyone, for all your time.